in this month set aside for the contemplation of love, we would be remiss not to cover the subject of sexuality. This week we'll take a look at erotic love or the love of and for the human body. So as I say on NPR, content warning, this episode recognizes the existence of sex. <laughs> <laughs> and a personal content warning, I really struggled with writing this sermon. This was one of the hardest ones ever. So I'm going to ask for a lot of grace from you. This is a delicate subject, and I had a lot of pause while I was writing. Is this too much? Should I be different? What's going on? This is a delicate subject, and um, it, like I said, I just I had a lot of time that I struggled. Um, there is no more delicate subject in the entire human canon than sexuality. At least I noticed that it brought up a lot of vulnerability for me as I was going, which typically is a struggle. It's also del hard to be both delicate and straightforward at the same time. So I ask for your patience if I meander around and for your grace if I'm unclear. Um, just a lot to balance. What I'm mostly interested in exploring this morning is the erotic rather than the sexual. We tend to think of these two as being one and the same, but the erotic exists outside of the realm of sexuality and vice versa. I defer to Audre Lorde in a lot of things, but especially in her definition of the erotic. Her groundbreaking work, Uses of the Erotic, is absolutely foundational to any discussion of the erotic as theological. This essay provides several definitions of the erotic. First, I will lift up the erotic as a source of power and information. A source of power and information. That was not included in today's reading, but I think it's very important. In our culture, we tend to think of the erotic as being exclusively sexual, but I would argue that we have all but removed the erotic from sexuality, at least the sexuality that is marketed to us through mainstream media and pornography. In both of these realms, sex exists solely as a means to an end rather than a source of power and information. We are, we are most accustomed to images and stories of sexuality that is easy, convenient, and or violent on some level. We live in a culture that is saturated with sex, but we also live in a culture that has all but removed the erotic from the sex. When Audre Lorde describes the erotic as a source of power and knowledge, she is not talking about power over or knowledge about another person. She is talking about power found in one's own body, as in empowerment. Likewise, she is talking about information about oneself and also information about the world. Remember that she describes the acts of dancing alone, building a bookcase, and writing a poem as being acts of the erotic. For Audre Lorde, the erotic is not found only in sexual acts, but in her experience of being in the world. She also, earlier in the essay, defines the erotic as the measure between the beginnings of our sense of self and the chaos of our strongest feelings. Dancing alone, building a bookcase, writing a poem are examples of activities that provide a great sense of satisfaction and a sense of accomplishment. Those are indeed strong feelings. For Audre Lorde, the erotic is the gap between our baseline understanding of ourself and the experience of strong sensation and emotion. She's making an allusion to a sexual climax. Now, everybody, at this point, I invite you to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that is a lot to hear this early on a Sunday morning, especially if you're not at brunch over a Bloody Mary. <laughs> it may not be what you expected to hear from your minister today, and I want you to know that I don't say that to be shocking at all. I say it because what Audre Lorde means, and what I want you to hear today, is that the experiences of being alive can be as full of excitement and joy as a sexual climax. What would it mean if every time you engaged in a creative or an intellectual endeavor, it was as fulfilling and as pleasurable as really good sex. How might that change your life? 
That's what we're talking about when we consider the erotic as something that is theological, something that is worthy to be lifted up in a worship service. Theology is not just the study of God, it is the study of what it means to be human and how we make sense of the world. Some of us make sense of the world by belief in God, and some of us do not. In this church, we affirm both paths as having equal value. We bring our questions and our collective knowledge together every week, and we try to feel a little different or have a new understanding of ourselves and the world. And that, friends, is an act of the erotic as power and knowledge. We use music and spoken word, silence, images, sometimes our other senses, to explore what it means to be alive here, what it means to understand that we are alive, and what to understand that we will only be alive for a short time. The erotic is a power that is derived from the body, and it is the means by which we love and understand this world and each other. This is what Audre Lorde is talking about in her example of the margarine with the yellow dye. I heard a lot of giggles and saw some nods of recognition. Some of us remember doing that. It's a beautiful illustration of honoring our body as a vehicle through which we experience and enjoy life, our body as a source of power and knowledge. When we learn how to release that little packet of joy within us, we can need its vibrancy through all the areas of our life. For Lord, this was a powerful awakening experience that moved her to demand <coughs> excellence of herself and all of her pursuits. It called her to surround herself with the life-giving and to remove the life-draining from her world. Her radical political and social justice ideology was driven by the knowledge that she could be happy, that she deserved to be happy, and that knowledge was driven by the joy of the erotic in her life. The erotic is the very source of life, and it is what connects us to one another. And notice here that I have not said that sexuality is the source of life. Rather, the erotic is the source of all life. Not all babies come from sex, and not all sex is procreative. We know this, but I feel like I should name it here. There are many variations on human sexuality, and as Unitarian Universalists, we affirm that all relationships founded on love and consent are equally good and holy. Whether or not they produce children or will produce children is immaterial. We also know that there are plenty of babies that are conceived through medical procedures. <coughs> but in this modern world, babies still result from and depend upon human relationships. That's also part of what we do here at church have relationships, healthy, boundary relationships with each other, and model that for our children. It is not sexuality that brings us together so much as it is the erotic, that power that knows and understands the world around us. This is what Ursula Goodenow was getting at in the excerpt that Donna shared as her first reading. Goodenow is a professor of biology and emerita at Washington University in St. Louis. Her field is cellular biology. She spent her entire career studying eukaryotic algae. Just like I don't know what a factorial is, I also do not know what eukaryotic algae are. <laughs> I know a lot about the algae. But I do know that Ursula Goodenow's study of that eukaryotic algae has given her a profound understanding of life. Her book, the Sacred Depths of Nature and her accompanying lecture entitled The Epic of Evolution are foundational texts in the theological field of religious naturalism. In these works, she explains a facet of evolutionary biology followed by a related spiritual reflection on how that scientific theory inspires her to a reverence for life. So getting back to the excerpt that was shared today, it was a story about her experience of saving her son from a riptide. She felt an innate maternal instinct that drove her to the water to save him, despite knowing that it was dangerous for her to do so. And she was met with the revelation, both of us survive, or both of us drown. And this is really the point of her antidote, both of us survive, or both of us drown. The chapter that this personal reflection follows 
is about the evolutionary development of emotions and attachment. Goody now asserts that sexual reproduction is what has made us and other animals communal. Animals that participate in asexual reproduction do not live in community with one another. They may live near each other because they have found a source of food, light, and air, but they do not depend on one another at all. Animals that participate in sexual reproduction, however, well, we need each other. We need each other for the exchange of genetic materials, but also our offspring are born helpless. And so we have developed elaborate social systems that allow us to safely and successfully rear our young. Without sexual reproduction, we would not have anything that we recognize. We would not have each other. We would not have families or neighborhoods, cities, a society. Sexual reproduction, as opposed to asexual reproduction, is what brings us together as a species, according to Ursula Goody now. So Audre Lorde, a poet, finds that the erotic exists as a source of power and knowledge that is something not necessarily a part and parcel of sexuality. Ursula Goody now, a biologist, asserts that all human relationships are grounded in sexual reproduction. It seems that no matter the lens we use, sexuality is a profound and powerful force in human life. Therefore, it is more than appropriate for us to consider the gift and the mystery of human sexuality through a theological lens. In fact, I would say that it's imperative that we do so. The common theological thread that I find between Audre Lorde and Ursula Goody now is the transformative power of human relationships. Whether sexual or not, there is something unspeakably holy about human relationships. We are inextricably linked to one another. Either we both survive or we both drown. Audre Lorde's work focused on equality in human relationships, especially in the fields of labor, gender equality, and race relations. Ursula Goody now is focused on the survival of species by the continual passing down of genetic material through sexual reproduction. These may seem like vastly different concepts, but I think they're basically <coughs> saying the same thing. They both call us to care for ourselves and for one another. In this time of high stakes and high anxiety, what would it mean for us to link our survival to each other's survival? What would it mean to value the experience of pleasure? What would it mean to value each other's right to the experience of pleasure? To consider the act of making a bookshelf as valuable as the act of caring for your body, as valuable as the act of making love, as valuable as the act of breathing slowly, as valuable as someone else's engagement in these activities. There is something radical, countercultural, <coughs> rebellious in this thought. It is the ultimate resistance to a culture that has taught us to work ourselves into the ground. A culture that teaches us that pleasure of any kind is an idle pursuit at best, and it is shameful at worst. A culture that says that pleasure and ease only belong to some of us. Loving our bodies, loving with and through our bodies, is how we work against those messages to reclaim the erotic power, which is the birthright of all humans, quite literally given to us through our evolutionary history. The erotic calls us out of the slumber of our culture that is somehow at once both puritanical and licentious to remember the true power of our bodies, to deepen our understanding of ourselves and the world. As we are held in the ease and the beauty of our Sunday morning worship service, let us consider the vast amount of good held in our bodies. We have been taught to distrust our bodies, most of us, in most areas of our lives. But why should we distrust the body when it is the primary vehicle the primary through which we live and the primary means through which we understand the world. 
throughout the rest of this day and in the week to come. I challenge you to find that pellet of joy inside your own body and the means by which to break it open. When you have found a way to release the joy into your life, I wish for you the courage to need its vibrancy into all areas, starting with love for the body, and then into your work, home, school, and recreational lives. We are each entitled to that love and that joy. So let us be fearless in choosing to embrace it. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.